Okay. Are we waiting for anyone else, Marissa, or is this everyone that you're planning in? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the Iowa Supreme Court's oral arguments. Before we start, I would like to go over a couple, just say a few words about the manner in which we are proceeding for oral arguments this morning. As you're all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected life in all sorts of ways. It has definitely affected how we do business in the courts. The Iowa Supreme Court continues to work very hard and we are issuing opinions, but out of concern for your, your health, as well as the health of the courts and our staff, we have temporarily modified the way in which we conduct oral arguments. We are proceeding today by way of virtual oral arguments, and we are glad to have this alternative available. Fortunately, the public will continue to have an opportunity to view oral arguments as well. We have a YouTube channel, which allows the public to watch oral arguments in real time. Our YouTube channel can be accessed through our website. Through this alternative, we continue to provide access to justice as well as public access to our proceedings. Our court staff has worked very hard to make this technology work smoothly. I know they've worked with you as well as members of this court. Inevitably, there may be some glitches. If so, we ask that you please be patient and we will get through this together. With those preliminary remarks in the mind and out of the way, let's proceed. This morning, we have four cases set for, um, to be, for submission. The first three will have oral arguments. The fourth will be submitted without oral argument. The first case is Wormerskirchen versus Canadian National Railroad. Um, the second case is Bribiesco Ledger versus Klipsch. The third case is Baez versus Muting, Lewer, Northwest Iowa, Wingert and Ryder. And the final case is State of Iowa versus Weigand. At this juncture, we will begin with the first case and I will be uh, recusing myself from this case. So Justice Apple will take over presiding at this point. Thank you. Very good. Uh, welcome, Council. Um, shall we do a, a sound check to begin with? Um, uh, Mr. Talsma, would you just say a few words? Yeah, good morning, Your Honor. I take it you're able to hear us okay? Yes, I can. Very good. Uh, Mr. Gaffney, would you uh, say a few words, please? Yes, Your Honor. Todd Gaffney. And uh, I also take it that uh, you're able to hear us okay? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, very good. Well, we'll uh, with that, we'll begin with the uh, opening uh, argument, uh, Mr. Talisma. Your Honor, I believe Mr. I don't know if Mr. Gaffney was planning on going first. He's the resistor. Oh, I'm I sorry. Continue. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Yes, Thanks. Your Honor, uh, we sought an application for further review, so I believe I should go first. Uh, the procedural backgrounds in all of the briefs, so I'm not going to waste the uh, very short time I have this morning. Uh, but but I do want to say at the outset, uh, Your Honors, that this is, an Mr. Gaffney, this is Ed Mansfield. Could you speak up a little or get closer to the microphone? Yes, Your Honor. Can you hear me better, Judge? Yes. Uh, I was saying this is a very important case that um, if the court allows the court of appeal appeal decision to stand, it's going to affect the operations of all railroads in Iowa, not just my client, but all railroads in Iowa, and it will create an undue burden on interstate commerce. Um, we're here to talk about the duties of operating a train, not driving a train, not driving a car, but operating a train. Uh, the facts in this case permeate all of the issues. So they are very, very important. And I would like to highlight a few of them, if I may. This train uh, road grader vehicle accident occurred on January, January 8, 2013. It was a foggy day up in Northeast Iowa. Temperature was about 31 degrees. Visibility was limited for both the train crew and Mr. Wormer Skirtson. My client's train was westbound at the time. Uh, all trains have what they, you've heard of, uh, referred to as a black box. In the railroad jargon, it's called an event recorder. 
This train had a black box. It also had a video camera on the lead locomotive, which uh, depicted and showed what could be seen at the time of the incident. It's important to note, this was a 7,000 foot train, which is approximately a mile and a half to a mile and a quarter long. It had 4,000 tons of trailing railroad cars. It had two locomotives, each of which had a 5,000 gallon fuel tank underneath the feet of the train crew. It had 113 railroad cars. Three were loaded. The sixth car behind the train crew was a, a tank car, which was loaded with flammable liquid. Three were loaded, as I mentioned, 24 cars were empty and 86 were empty tank cars that would normally haul ethanol fuel from our ethanol plants in Northern Iowa. The event recorder, the black box shows prior to this incident, the train was traveling at 46 to 47 miles per hour. The Secretary of Transportation had determined that for this class of track at that location, the speed limit was 60 miles per hour. So this train moments before this incident was 13 miles per hour below the federal regulations. The uh, train has eight notches that the uh, engineer can use to control its operation. It controls the speed, the braking, et cetera. The black box shows that before this accident, the train engineer had the uh, throttle in the fourth position, but moments before he moved it to idle. He shut the throttle off moments before this accident. The train was traveling at 70 feet per second. The locomotives, there were two of them, each had 12 steel wheels. They call those trunks. The 113 trailing cars each had four wheels. So we're talking over approximately 900 steel wheels on a steel rail as this train approached the crossing. Needless to say, it was lumbering and rumbling towards this crossing. Uh, it was nonetheless noisy. And I, I know the Supreme Court building sits right above railroad tracks. I'm certain the court understands how noisy trains can be, how noisy their whistles and horns can be. The lead locomotive had two headlights producing 200,000 candela, which my understanding is that's approximately five to 10 times brighter than a motor vehicle headlight. It had two ditch lights down beneath the locomotive. So it had the headlight and two ditch lights that oscillated which sent signals out and which permitted the train crew to see the right of way. But you had that distinctive triangle from the lead locomotive that they sometimes talk about. The event recorder shows the bell was ringing. The event recorder also shows that the engineer began sounding the whistle pursuant to federal law, almost 20 seconds before this crossing, he was in compliance with federal law. He was also in compliance with federal law in the sequence that he was sounding the whistle. Mr. Gaffney, this is uh, Ed Mansfield. Um, yes, let me, if you don't mind, let me interrupt the, the narrative a little bit now. Um, as I read, uh, the Court of Appeals opinion, and I want you to let me know if I'm reading it the same way you do or not. As I read the Court of Appeals opinion, they basically agree with you 
that the claims relating to the speed of the locomotive are preempted by federal law, but they find an issue of fact on what the crew could or should have done when the grader became visible. Am I, is that correct? Well, yes, Your Honor, <laughs> you are correct. I think what the Court of Appeals first, they did not find under um, the, the federal regulations, there is federal speed preemption. Um, uh, if uh, footnote 15 of Easterwood, if you've read uh, the decision in the briefs, federal uh, footnote 15 says the train crew has a duty to slower stop for a specific uh, individual hazard, Court of Appeals didn't go there. Court of Appeals, in my opinion, got off track. Uh, again, as I stated, they, they in page 13, the first 13 pages, I would pretty much agree with your honor. They talked about federal preemption and the uniformity that we want, that the Secretary of Transportation can enact rules, horn, whistle, uh, uh, hours of operation, et cetera. Uh, but then at page 13, uh, they got off track. And immediately, the very first thing they state under proper to look out, Your Honor, is in the context of the motoring public, the duty to maintain a proper lookout, et cetera. The law imposes a duty on motorists to proceed with such care under the existing conditions known or should have been known. So in the, the, the Bakke Weisen case that the plaintiffs rely upon, which is the only case they can rely upon in the, the face of overwhelming uh, majority opposite of that case, this Bakke Heisen court, who <laughs> curiously the judge's name was Bell, Judge Bell um, fell into this uh, derailment, if you will, fell off track and went right to the duties of a motorist motor vehicle uh, operator, and then and then said um, um, that that. Uh, if I can find my case here, that weather comes and goes, it arises and abates. And we all know that weather in Iowa doesn't arise and abate at individual. Okay, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I read page 13 a little bit differently. I see the argument here as uh, that the, as a failure to keep a, a lookout that if they're with respect to this particular hazard at this particular crossing, if the crew had kept a proper look, lookout, the Court of Appeals hypothesizes, they would have been able to stop the train in time, even if it was going 46 to 47 miles an hour. Is it your view that under the undisputed facts that would not have been possible? Yes, Your Honor. I think it's absolutely clear, and Judge Fangman was absolutely correct, that the undisputed evidence, even plaintiff's own experts, that says there wasn't time to stop this train in six seconds. The video shows six seconds when this uh, uh, road grader came into view. Our expert says that even putting the train in the emergency immediate, instantaneously, the speed would have only changed by one mile per hour. And the train would have arrived at exactly the same time. So as I said at the, the opening, causation permeates all of these issues in the case. It permeates lookout, it permeates train speed. There was nothing this train crew could do at the time. And, and the biggest question I have in this case is the claim the railroad failed to maintain a proper lookout. And the Court of Appeals disagreed with that, said there's a fact question. Well, I say, and I want to ask, what did they do improper? There is nothing they did improper. They they saw the train when they could see it. They saw it at six seconds. They testified to that. 
They they had uh, if you want to talk the horn real quick, they had sounded the whistle, the bell, four hundred times that morning. They tested it, blew the whistle at their terminal inspection, and then as they headed from uh, Dubuque towards Waterloo, they went through one hundred crossings. And at each crossing, they were required by federal law, and the event recorder shows it. They blew four times, two longs, a short, and a long. Four times, 100 crossing is 400 times they blew that whistle that morning. Furthermore, that whistle had passed, passed an FRA mandated decibel test. It was within 96 to 110 decibels when tested. And the facts, the train, the fact the train crew blew it 400 times, said there was nothing wrong with the whistle. The sound was as if it all- Council, uh, yes, we've sir. often said, we've often said that uh, a causation is, is a poor issue to be decided by summary judgment. Is there any room in this record for it for a jury to conclude if they had hit the brakes right away, the reduction in speed might have led to um, less of an injury. Is that a jury question or, or not on this record? Your Honor, I believe on this record, it is not a jury question. And my answer is based on their own expert. He says there was nothing the train crew could do to avoid this accident at 47 miles per hour. It's also based on my expert analysis by Foster Peterson. He's an expert in training operations. He's an expert in it, reading, interpreting black boxes, and he and stopping distances. He cleared this train stopped once it was dumped or placed into emergency. It took it 1,600 feet to stop. It's traveling at 70 feet per second. There was nothing this train crew could have done. They would have had to place it in emergency back at the so-called whistle post where he started blowing 20 seconds earlier. So no, Your Honor, there was absolutely nothing this train crew that could have done that would have slowed it by one mile per hour or would have the, the time of arrival at the crossing would have been absolutely the same. The unfortunate circumstances would have been the same. If I may conclude quickly, uh, uh, I know my time just about up, but what do I want this court to do? One, I want the court to say plaintiff's excessive speed claim is uh, preempted pursuant to Easterwood. Two, I'm asking the court to rule that adverse weather conditions in Iowa and in the overwhelming majority of states is not a specific individual hazard. I'm asking the court to rule that adverse weather conditions can be and are encompassed in national uniform standards, i.e. the federal train speed regulation. I'm asking the court to rule that certainly adverse weather conditions were practical considerations considered by the Secretary of Transportation. And indeed, I'm asking the court, and this is very important, to tell all railroads which operate in Iowa that when they enter the state of Iowa, they will not be faced with- Mr. Gaffney, you need to conclude, please. Rules, and their commerce will flow freely and not burdened by the rules set by the state of Iowa. Thank you very much. We'll add a, an extra minute onto your time, Mr. Uh, Talzma. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel, my name is Jordan Talzma and I represent Rick and Carol Wormerskirchen in this case. Mr. Gaffney got into this a little bit, but I wanna just say that on January 28th, 2013, Rick Wormerskirchen was operating his road grader as part of his employment with Blackhawk County when he was struck by a Chicago Central and Pacific freight train at a gravel road crossing. We filed an action for negligence, including claims for failure to maintain a proper lookout, failure of the train crew to slow or stop the train to avoid the collision, and several claims regarding the train's horn. 
Prior to the trial in this case, the district court granted summary judgment on the lookout and the breaking claims, specifically finding that those claims were preempted under the Federal Railroad Safety Act. We filed the appeal following the trial on the Horn claims and on appeal to court. Oh, wait a minute. Um, this is Ed Mansfield. Didn't uh, Judge Fangman also, uh, also find a failure of causation on the lookout and the uh, failure to slow the train claims? Didn't she, that wasn't that an alternative ruling of hers? Your Honor, I think we had noted in our briefing with the Court of Appeals that that issue appeared to be blended by the district court. It was a little bit unclear exactly uh, based on the language used by the district court, the basis for the decision. The Court of Appeals in its decision found that that decision was, by the district court was primarily based or solely based on preemption principles. And we believe that that is a reasonable interpretation um, of the district court's ruling. Well, as I well, mentioned this case. Well, let me follow up. Uh, uh, I'm inclined to think that your lookout claim as a matter of law is not necessarily preempted. Um, you can have a, a, a lookout problem at a relatively slow rate of speed. But uh, the causation issue uh, is a live wire. Um, and as Justice Waterman has pointed out, generally speaking, we say that causation is a matter for a jury. Uh, but <laughs> this case may be the exception. Mr. Gaffney says really that, um, look, you can't make the, 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 the causation argument. So give us your best evidence on causation that the that, that, uh, lookout uh, is the live wire here and not foreclosed by the length of the train and some of the facts that uh, Mr. Gaffney shared with us. Sure. Your Honor, I think you, you, you mentioned it, but you know, most of the time ordinarily, as it was pointed out by the Court of Appeals, this is an issue for the jury to decide. We want to avoid the court deciding these issues as a matter of law. We believe that we should have had the opportunity at trial to cross-examine the defense expert, Foster Peterson, regarding his calculation of the stopping distance and the braking distance. We believe that he miscalculated that. We believe that he used an incorrect analysis by looking at the stopping time after the collision. And well, I, using but, look, I'm sorry. Um, this is a motion for summary judgment. We can only look at the summary judgment record, it seems to me. I mean. Um, so whatever cross-examination might have happened at trial, I, I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, I'd, I'd like you to be kind of specific and, and direct us what part of the summary judgment record should we be examining uh, to give you sufficient evidence to survive uh, summary judgment on the lookout claim? Well, I think if you go back and look at the district court filings and you specifically look at the timing of the summary judgment filings, this trial, I believe, was initially set at the beginning of October of 2000, judgment on July 20th, 2017. That summary judgment that was filed that day did not have any causation argument as part of the summary judgment. It wasn't until after the plaintiffs had resisted in August, at the end of August, August 28th, as part of the defendant's reply, and as a supplement to their initial summary judgment that they first, for the first time, file their expert report from Foster Peterson, and for the first time argue causation is an issue. At that point, the rebuttal expert deadline had well passed. The deposition deadline had passed. It was approximately 35 days before trial, and the defendant, or the, excuse me, the plaintiffs never really had an opportunity at that point in the proceedings before the trial to establish the record and we should have been given that opportunity at trial, not only to examine or cross-examine the defense expert, but also the opportunity to clarify the remarks from um, our Mr. Talzma, yes, this sir. is Justice McDonald. I have a follow-up question to that. It, I take it from your answer then to yes, Justice sir. Apple's question is, there is nothing in the summary judgment record on causation. And if you think there is, I guess I would ask the question again, what specific facts are in dispute and where in the summary judgment record are those supported? 
So we did have an affidavit, Your Honor, from the plaintiff himself, Rick Wormerskirchen. Uh, this case is a little bit different than the usual train crash cases because most of the plaintiffs don't survive. Um, he submitted an affidavit as part of the summary judgment record, specifically identifying the actions that he took as he approached the crossing, identifying that he did not see any movement or any any sort of indication on behalf of the train crew that they were taking any sort of evasive action and that his determination to do what he did with his road grader, which again is about a 35 to 40 foot long vehicle, was based on uh, in part the train crew's action or inaction. So we did have the affidavit from Mr. Warmerskirchen at that time. And again, going back to the ability to cross-examine the defense expert, we believe that he also failed to take into consideration the movement of the uh, uh, road grader as well um, as the movement of the train crew and how those two affected or impacted each other. Counsel, uh, Justice Waterman here, did, did you ask in resisting summary judgment, did you ask uh, for time to take the uh, uh, defense experts deposition? So as part of the initial resistance, I believe that was filed August 11th or so of 2017. Again, the, the expert report was not filed with the court as part of the summary judgment filings until August 28th of 2017. Um, at that point, uh, we, we did, I do not believe I was not fully involved with um, uh, the district court proceedings, Your Honor, but I do not believe um, it, it it ever came up to, to, at that point, ask for an opportunity to depose um, the defense expert at that time. However, I, I guess I would note that I, I, I'm not sure the defense, it was our our option at that point, or our, our um, desire at that point to cross-examine him for the first time at trial um, in front of the jury. We believe that um, that is a procedural uh, mechanism that we would have been able to use to, to not do it as a deposition to give him the opportunity to be prepared for trial later. Well, but to wait do a minute. In the wait trial. A minute. Here's the problem that I see. Um, I understand what you're saying about causation coming up kind of late in the summary judgment process. Um, all right. Uh, but our rules allow for um, additional discovery. If you want additional discovery, um, it seems to me the time to object to the, to the late, late emergence of causation was when the summary judgment motion was pending. It looks like you stood on the record, um, um, including the record of your own expert, which um, is not necessarily all that helpful as far as I can tell. I mean, aren't, I mean, I, I, let me put it to you point blank. It seems to me, um, to the extent you, you're complaining about lateness of the hour and so forth, that issue may not be preserved. Yeah, yeah. so Your Honor, I understand, I understand the point and certainly the questions. Um, I do want to make the the point that the Court of Appeals made as it relates stated by the defendants, um, I think that there were also other statements as part of our experts report that were noted in the Court of Appeals decision um, that specifically, I'm just trying to find it, Your Honor, that the dangerous conditions, quote, rob the crew of the time to react and take defensive measures such as slowing the train. Um, so I think that there were other comments within that report um, and again, we should have the opportunity to clarify that with um, with our expert at trial. But uh, one more point, if I could ask about the procedural um, situation, Mr. Talisman. Um, isn't it true the trial was, may have been originally scheduled in 2017, but it got pushed back like a year, right? So it's after good. this summary judgment ruling, the defendant actually came back and made a, another effort to get summary judgment on the horn claims and nothing would have prevented you from you know, taking a crack at overturning the ruling on the on the lookout claims right yeah i, I guess to that point your honor it would be the court of appeals or excuse me the district court at that time had already 
um, granted summary judgment um, regarding those claims. We believe that those claims were um, taken off the table, essentially. We did file an application for an interlocutory uh, review to the Supreme Court. That was denied. Um, so at that point, you know, I, th I think the decision was to simply move forward based on the claims that were left, which were, of course, the Horn claims. Um, and, that, and that's, you know, that's what we ended up doing. I do want to make a point as it relates back to the preemption issue. And, and you got a trial on the Horn claims. I understand there's some trial issues, but those went to the jury, right? Yeah, correct. So we, we, of course, we resisted it, but in the event that the Supreme Court took it, we are asking um, for a reversal of the Court of Appeals um, decision uh, related to a couple of jury instructions on the Horn claim. The, the primary one is instruction number 25. We believe that that instruction was misleading and confusing to the jury. That instruction deals with the federal Horn audibility requirements, uh, specifically 49 CFR 229.129, which deals with the railroad's duties to make sure that the train horn is sounding uh, the correct decibel level between 96 and 110 decibels. We believe that that is an ongoing continued obligation of the train crew and the railroad. Um, and we had asked the district court to include uh, language at the end of that jury instruction to make that uh, known to the jury, specifically the language at the time of the accident, the horn needed to be operating at that sound level. That language was not added by the district court. We believe that then gives the jury basically the insinuation that, well, because the train horn had been tested in May of 2010, uh, three years before this crash, and at that time it sounded between 96 and 110, that that meant basically that it was operating in that manner on the date of this collision. We do not think that that is the proper um, uh, way that that should be interpreted. And we cited the case of Hughes versus Union Pacific, which is a 2017 case out of the Western District of Missouri in support of that proposition. And we believe that it was error for the district court not to include that language um, as it relates to, to that your instruction and the Horn claim, Your Honor. For the proper lookout, I do want to mention that real quick. The Court of Appeals opinion um, on page 13, you know, the second paragraph right underneath of that, it says, by the same token, train crews have a general duty to keep a proper look, lookout for motorists approaching a crossing. That statement is consistent with existing Iowa law. There's the Hoyt case from this court in 1973, which found that a train crew has a duty to keep a proper lookout. The Garcia case from 2013 with the Court of Appeals found that both a motorist and a train crew have a duty to keep a proper lookout. Now, the issue in those two cases, Hoyt and Garcia, was that the lookout claim never went in front of the jury because the evidence in that, those cases were clear that the train crew had been keeping a proper lookout. Despite Mr. Gaffney's assertions this morning, there's absolutely no evidence in this record that the train crew was keeping a proper lookout. In fact, the only evidence in the record shows that they threw themselves on the ground immediately before the collision, that they didn't break until 10 seconds after the collision. There were no affidavits in the summary judgment um, filings from the train crew about what they did to see um, what the road grader was doing as it approached um, the crossing. I, I, um, I agree with you, Mr. Talisman, that as to whether the crew is negligent or not, that would be hard to resolve as a matter of law. But on causation, uh, we've all, I think, looked at the video of, from taken from the front of the train of the, that front locomotive that's in the record. And would you agree with me? It it's pretty much impossible to see the grader till about seven seconds before the collision. Well, I, I think an interesting point on that is, yes, I, I think from the video, you know, and what the video actually shows, um, it, it's about six or seven, really what the train crew could have seen, though. A train crew 
crew's vision, um, no evidence showing what the train crew did. Um, and we never had the opportunity or they never submitted any evidence saying that they were looking left and right and straight ahead and they could see um, beyond what was shown on the event recorder. So your honors, I see that I'm almost out of time. We would ask that uh, this court affirm the Court of Appeals decision as it relates to the preemption issues, causation, and to reverse the decision as it relates to the Horn claims and ultimately remand this case back to trial on all of the claims. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Talsma. Uh, Mr. Gaffney, uh, uh, rebuttal. You're muted, Mr. Gaffney. Thank you very much. I'm glad you were be able you were able to watch the video because uh, it's the most valuable piece of evidence on causation. Um, you know, you, you have to build into this, um, which my expert did not do. I think all of his are, are his opinions are excluding perception and reaction time. And I think uh, it's generally recognized that perception and reaction can take one and a half, two seconds. So if, if we're talking seven seconds, as Justice Mansfield uh, mentioned, I, I see it as six. Um, build in a second and a half to two seconds to react. I mean, if, if I throw a ball at you and you're not expected, expected, expecting it, the first thing you're gonna do is react like this. And um, you know, my, my, my crew has been criticized for hitting the floor. Well, they were reacting to a road grader that they knew could and might derail their train. And they hit the crew, the, the Mr. Warmer Skirtson, um, and I don't mean to uh, make his injuries meaningless, but he's been referred to as a victim in this case. I've had a lot of these railroad cases and they always forget about train crew. Train crews are victims. These fellows had a family and they wanted to go home too. And they know they, they had a 5,000 gallon fuel tank underneath their feet. So reaction time is not built into uh, what you see on that video. So really we're not talking seven seconds. We're talking three seconds, four seconds. And it's funny, more even I mean, if we're that close, I mean, what can you do on causation? There's nothing you can do. Well, but 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 one second could make a whole heck of a lot of difference. I mean, um, well, the, the manner in which the the accident occurred, uh, yeah. don't you think? Well, sure, Your Honor, but my expert who analyzed it. And, and, you know, the plaintiff had an expert on the horn. He could have also analyzed it. My expert says 46, 47, that the time of arrival would have been the same. I think the difference, Your Honor, is the plaintiff's argument that, well, coulda, woulda, shoulda, if I had that one second, I wouldn't have been hurt as bad, or I would have done this, I would have done that. That's pure speculation, that's been brief. On the horn issue, uh, uh, at the time of the accident, as the uh, Mr. Talsma uh, talked about the, the Hugs case, H-U-G-H-S, and jury instruction number 25. Um, the, the, and again, I had expert testimony on this from Foster Peterson. The federal regs are interpreted to read once, one and done, essentially, once the horn is tested and it passes the 96 to 110, which this did, it was 102. It's good unless it goes in for a repair. And again, I, I don't mean to belabor it, but 400 times that morning, the whistle was sounded. And the, the Hugs case at footnote three clearly says, <clears throat> excuse me, after talking about the horn, it has to be 96 to 110 at the time of the accident. <clears throat> excuse me, at footnote three, the very last sentence, it says, however, 
the court realizes that certain evidence which may not be a breach in and of itself may be relevant as to the issue of whether the horn sounded between 96 to 110. And the Court of Appeals yeah. went Counsel, right back, back, back to causation. Is there any evidence in the summary judgment record that the uh, the train crew had a broader field of vision such that they they could have seen the road grader before it appears on the video. None, Your Honor. So again, this is important to all railroads, not just my client. Um, are they going to have to operate their trains not knowing uh, whether it's it's sunny in Des Moines and, and foggy in Waterloo, uh, are they going to become weathermen uh, in adverse conditions and, and have to decide back and forth? The Secretary of Transportation has enacted uniform rules which do not, if you follow, would not burden interstate commerce. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the argument, Council. And this uh, case is submitted. Uh, we'll stand at ease uh, to prepare for the next oral argument.